everyone and welcome. Uh, we were trying to wait for a few more people. We had um, 30 or so people um, registered, but I think people are running late today. Uh, so for the folks that are here, um, we're not gonna make you wait any longer. Um, so thank you for being here this morning. Now I'm Lynette white Colin, the Vice President of Small Business at the New Orleans Business Alliance. Um, we run a program here called Invest NOLA, where we focus on high growth potential businesses that are owned by entrepreneurs of color. So the program fills a gap uh, that has existed in our local ecosystem, uh, and we are now providing resources um, that are needed to um, support businesses that are at the $1 million floor um, and helping to um, augment growth in those organizations. Um, so what we've done is built an ecosystem of resources that respond to those needs, that connects business owners to market opportunities in both the public and private sectors uh, to custom designed uh, capital products. Uh, we work with a consortium of three local financial institutions. And finally, um, we um, provide an advanced level management education program uh, through our partner uh, Tulane University. It's a six month program uh, where we uh, present a very uh, advanced level um, a program of executive education. And in that program, we supplement with extremely knowledgeable and experienced practitioners and other industry experts um, like the presenter will have today. So the Invest NOLA program is New Orleans's implementation of a national program that is sponsored by JP Morgan Chase called Ascend. Um, and it's a business accelerator program where 13 uh, urban cities are now participating, um, New Orleans uh, included. Um, and the program actually, each city gets to determine, you know, what is the most pressing need for their city and gets to design um, their program to, to meet those needs. And so in New Orleans, we've opted to work with entrepreneurs of color that are at a million dollars in annual revenue or more. And our intent is to grow those companies into $10 million companies within three to five years. Um, and to do that, we use that three, um, 3M three approach of management markets and money. So we did graduate our first cohort of 13 businesses this past spring. Each of those businesses identified a very aggressive growth opportunity for their businesses. Um, they designed a growth strategy to implement um, with the help of our university partners, our business practitioners, industry experts, and each participant was assigned a mentor who helped them to craft that strategy. And so those strategies are actually designed to scale the businesses to that $10 million mark within five years. So today we've invited you all to experience just a sampling of the executive management education uh, component of the Invest NOLA program um, as an offering uh, to assist all local business owners um, while we're experiencing some very uncertain times. So we'd like to thank our sponsors, JP Morgan Chase and the Serdna Foundation, as well as our local partners here, um, many procurement partners, uh, the three financial institutions that make up the financial consortium and a diverse advisory board, all who work very diligently to maintain excellence in the Invest NOLA program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Mr. Dave Parker. Uh, so besides being just an exceptionally great guy, uh, Dave is also an entrepreneur, a five times founder, venture capitalist and board member. He's been involved in nine transactions as a founder and board member. His 25 plus year career has highlighted his ability to innovate new ideas and scale product and services companies in the US and internationally. Dave is frequently invited to speak at community, university and accelerator events across the globe. He started his venture capital career with Mitsui and Company in Cupertino, California. He served as senior VP of programs and people for UP Global, the merged parent company of Startup Weekend and Startup America. In 2014, the UP Global team held over 1,250 events in 120 countries, 640 cities worldwide, with over 74,000 attendees. So the nonprofit company was sold to Techstars in June of 2015. 
So recognizing a gap in the market between the Startup Weekend Inspire events and accelerator programs, Dave started his own program with a corresponding book called Six Months Startup, which in part is the basis of the content for today's session and the content that Dave provides to entrepreneurs in multiple cities globally. So today we're gonna to be talking about exit optionality. And for those of you who have been with us for the full series, you know that we've talked about um, finance, we've talked about pivoting, uh, we've talked about um, just strategy uh, during uncertain times. And so today uh, we're gonna to pick up the topic of ex exit optionality. And it may not be something that most people have thought about, but it's something that you really should be thinking about as a business owner and entrepreneur. So without further ado, Dave, please take it away. Thanks, Lynn. So, and thanks everybody for uh, being here. I know this is a smaller audience than usual, but it's also a smaller topic than usual because not everybody's thinking about it though. I think to Lynette's point, it's one of those topics you should be thinking about. Um, after all, you've created value. Now the question is how do you capture that value for what you've created? <laughs> And what do you do with it? So today we're talking about buying and selling and optionality relative to who buys and how does that, how do the mechanics of the process work? So think of this as a, uh, a primer today around how you should think about exiting the company. And uh, like a lot of us who are in our age group of, I'm, I'm at the end of the baby boomer age group, but there's the biggest transition of boomers. Like I have a company now, what do I do with it? So the question is, is it time to be to buy? Is it time to sell? So the, the slides, I've shared a link at the very top of the notes there with the slides on SlideShare today. And I'll make sure that they're out to you as follow-up to this too, but they're on that, that link there on the below for, from Bitly. So from a, a agenda today, it's really choose your own adventure, right? So where do you want to take this? A lot of us got into business because we created our own jobs or we were passionate about an idea or a particular customer. Um, or we were really good at a particular service and we just left our companies and went and started our own. But where does that end is the question and how do you, how do you capture some value for the value that you've created? So we're talking about choose your own adventure and what that path is. A little bit about market conditions, obviously with the, the stuff going on and continuing to going on for COVID, it's like, what, what do we do with that? Um, building a bit of a market map so you can think about who potential buyers or sellers might be. Um, valuation in terms and how deals come together because more often than not, deals blow apart because of deal terms, not because of price. So um, the due diligence process, which again, just kind of a primer, so don't, don't worry too much if you haven't heard too much about it. Um, and then finally, kind of business development as a process, like how do you build a timing for a process to consider a future exit of some kind? So, and then Q and A as we go. This is the good news is this is a small group. So think of this as a, a coaching session for your business as much as anything else. So elephant in the room um, is, oh my gosh, things are kind of crazy still. And what do we do? And COVID has created, it seems like massive tailwinds or massive headwinds. So if you have a business that um, it created headwinds, the answer is we're just we're still in survival mode. Right, and the answer is that's great. Monthly plans are awesome because long-term planning is super uh, difficult to do when there's so much uncertainty. At the same time, COVID's also created massive tailwinds. Um, I was on a board call yesterday with a company who's doing really well. Like we were super worried for the first three months because most of our customers were big retail brands and um, the, the team has iterated on the product a little bit, launched a new product, hired some new staff. And we're actually in a weirdly good cash position. So it was, it was one of those strange moments where you're like, huh, that's actually kind of good, right? So regardless of its headwinds or tailwinds, it's kind of looking at that as a trend and going, okay, how do I use this momentum that I have right now to move on to whatever that next step is? And that next step may be buying and that next step may be selling. So if you think about the the process here of buying or selling, and I really am taking it from both sides today, is you may be like, hey, I'm in a spot where we could go buy our competitor. How do I do that? Or I'm in a spot of, hey, I think it's maybe time for me to think about retiring. How do I capture some that rather than just close the business down? So um, as I always tell founders when I talk to them, it's really about you, right? So what, what do you want to do? I was talking with a gal uh, this week who 
um, has a business, they had an offer to sell, um, there's what's traditionally called a lockup period. So uh, the buyer will come in and they'll sign a letter of intent and they have a window to close. And they didn't close on that window and now she's thinking about what else she might wanna do. Um, and we talked about the mechanics and we talked about different things. And I'm like, ultimately this comes down to Aaron, what do you wanna do? Like, do you wanna spend more time with your kids? Are you excited about the growth of the business and do you wanna double down and stay with the company? And she's like, you know, no one's ever talked to me about it that way, right? It's always been about the company and about the shareholders or the board. And I'm like, some people have a board, some people don't. So ultimately from a founder perspective, it comes down to what do you wanna do? And is it, is it a chance for you to go grow the business and double down? Or I think all of us are experiencing the, the you know, seven months post COVID waiting for everything to happen next. And of course, the, here the Neil deGrasse Titan or uh, talk about the fact that there's a meteor coming the, the day before the election day was just like, oh yeah, we've had everything else so far. Like the aliens are like, that didn't even become news. So, you know, are you tired or do or you have like, you're energized? Right, and I would, I would say, take that as the personal survey first of what do you wanna go do? Because if you do get into the buying mode, it's all about the energy and enthusiasm and gas in the tank to go do that. If you're thinking about selling, it's still a process that you have to run through and a process is a lot of work to know that, so you can get it to a particular point and get the transaction done and create some competitive options there too so you can keep your price reasonable. So who are you gonna to sell to then becomes the next question or to whom are you gonna sell? Are you gonna sell it to an outside company, somebody you don't know or somebody who's been a competitor or somebody who's potentially a financial buyer? Um, and we'll talk about that option. Are you gonna sell it to your employees um, or are you gonna sell it to your family members? Keep in mind the last two options are they're gonna use your money to buy your company from you. Because typically if you're selling it to your employees, they don't have the money to buy it. So you have to structure a deal so it can create cash for you and payments over time that allow them to take the ownership of the business and allows you to get cash for the value you've created. The same is true with family members. And I'll go through a case study that's a particular uh, family member case study that I, I walk through as well. So outside company, pretty clean in the process, or if you're going to go buy somebody pretty clean in the process, it's like, we're going to go buy the company, there's assets, there's liabilities, we're going to make them an offer. We'll walk through those mechanics. But if you decide you're thinking about selling it, maybe like I'd, I'd like it to, to keep the business going, but I don't necessarily want to work there anymore. Maybe my employees can buy it or maybe my kids can buy it. And we'll walk through that as a case study example of how you might do that for um, in either of those two examples. So to whom becomes the question. So the next thing is, is, um, is the business bankable? And is it time to sell? So we've talked about um, being predictable and forecastable revenue and building a growth plan uh, like Annette's team has worked on with the Ascend program is like, you need to have a growth plan in place, but you also need to be executing on that growth plan so that a bank can look at it and say, oh, you're not, this is a question of like, it's growth capital, not risk capital. And what banks think about with that is if you're currently spending $500 a month on advertising, what would happen if you spent $5,000 a month on advertising? doesn't matter what the number is or where the decimal point is, but it's more about forecastable and predictable results. So bankability is obviously hard, but you can um, look at existing businesses that either have banking relationships or existing businesses that you know, where you're like, oh, we're gonna ex ex expand to Shreveport, or we're gonna go to a bigger city, or we're gonna go uh, to a new location. That would be one way to look at existing businesses. The nice thing about an existing business is it has a track record which means it's more likely to be bankable than a brand new business. Like if we were to do a startup business, the answer is it's all about your personal guarantee, not about the business itself. So buying an existing business is actually easier than starting a business in some ways because it has a track record, it has a customer base. It doesn't always mean it's bankable and it's, that's always the challenge in the community that you're in. Is it time to sell? Um, are you tired or are your investors tired? Um, there's a lot of companies I know right now that took investor money a year ago, five years ago, and they took the investor money in, in the term of a convertible debt instrument. Um, startups are particularly good at that. And a lot of those debt instruments have now expired. So technically they're in default. Nobody really thinks about them that way, but there's this wave of, of convertible debt that, that's out there that's going to cost some companies to look at what do they do with it. So some will convert it to stock and equity. Um, some of them will have to pay that debt back. 
and someone will have to just extend the current debt options. But it could get into the question of um, one of the companies that I was on the board of just had some tired investors. The investors put money in at one point and they were just like, we want to get that money out. Um, that's particularly true of institutional investors, um, folks like venture capitalists. Uh, they have a timing window that they're investing in from their fund. And at the end of that timing window, their limited partners want that money back uh, versus a perpetual investment. So if it's time to sell, if you have solid growth, if your numbers and growth numbers are good, it's a great time to sell. Um, selling has an analogy to banking, right? Is that when you don't need the money, it's a great time to get money. Or uh, when, it's, it, when the business is going great, could be a great time to sell. Um, in a time to buy decision, your decision there is like, do I personally have the energy and enthusiasm to look at buying a company? And if so, what would I want to buy it for? Would I want to buy it for my existing product and expand my geography? Or do I want to buy it for my existing customer base and expand my product line? So think of them as two, two different axes. One is just expanding into new geographies and one is expanding into new product lines. So, and if you identified who that company is that you might go about buying. The same question you're asking is the same question that business owner is asking, which is I've been in business for 12, 15, 22 years. Uh, how do I sell it or do I just close it down, right? So in, that, in your case as a buyer, you can actually approach a business and say, hey, I'd like to think about how we might buy that business um, and give them a job and a paycheck with an earnout, which they can go down over time in their, their work. And then, as I mentioned, it really is just all about you. It's, it's the next adventure of I'm super energized about this or the thought of this makes me exhausted. Like, so if, if it's the thought of it makes me exhausted, the answer is, Probably time to sell, but keep your energy high until you get this transaction done. So, because people want to know that like, oh, you're going to help do this deal as well. So um, what impacts uh, the market map and who could be your buyer? Um, in some businesses, it's all about the strategic acquirer. It could be somebody who's a bigger competitor than you and wants access to New Orleans. Uh, it could be somebody who's a financial investor for bigger companies. And this is typically a bigger company threshold where, excuse me, where they, they believe in this market and they're doing what's called a roll-up of the market. And the idea of a roll-up is we're gonna do one national brand, but we're gonna have 16 different locations and 16 different major metros. Um, so in that case, they're a financial buyer versus a, a strategic buyer. So they're, they're investing because they like the business, uh, they like the theme, but now they're looking for the right business. Um, and this happens with franchises all the time, by the way, when a franchise owner decides they wanna get out of the business, the franchisor will try to, to arrange for a buyer to take over the business. And that's pretty typical because they don't want to lose the franchise. So the franchisor will, will help facilitate an introduction to another buyer. So, and then private equity firms are, are straight financial investors. And there's a few of them in different vertical markets um, that really look at it and say, we have this, this concept of a, a plugin and a platform. And the platform is here's the main company where um, investing in, and then we're going to give them the capital to invest in additional companies and buy additional companies. So not always the option for smaller companies, but just so you know, that's kind of the way the market shapes up. Strategic buyers, bigger companies in your space, or financial buyers. A strategic buyer is making a decision to buy your company for just that reason. It's strategic. Like we need a, we need a location in your city. We want your customer base. You have some great customers that we could sell additional products or services to. That's strategic. Financial buyers are just doing it in the math, right? So, uh, is this a good deal or not? Like, can we can we buy the company at a net present value calculation? So we look at your cash flow. We're gonna give you a price. Um, typically, they're gonna give you what's called an earnout, which means they're gonna they're gonna have you continue to run the business. And then over time, they'll continue to pay you out as your commitment to time goes down. You'll just continue to get paid as if you're an employee uh, in a couple different structures. So one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how do I value my business? What's my business worth? And the answer is, it's hard. Um, I used to own a classic car. And the answer is, it's worth exactly what you can sell it for. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, so it was an old Thunderbird convertible. It was in the mid sixties, one of those really big ones. Um, it was a great gold car, but you had to find the person who loved it. Like they had to fall in love with it. Cause if they were just a financial buyer, right? The answer is they would lowball you on the price. 
But if somebody's like, oh, I love that one. I, I always wanted that color. That's a great car. Then that's somebody who will pay a premium for it versus paying a discount for it. That's the difference between a strategic and a financial buyer. So the same is true. Sadly, there's no great valuation way to sell a company. And it's not as much of a formula as I know most founders would like to believe. So um, what there's some factors that drive it. So if you're in the service business today, which is you have people who are delivering the services that you provide, most services businesses are valued at 0.75 to 1.5x, what's called trailing 12 month revenue or TTM. So if you did a million dollars in revenue last year, the company is probably worth between $750,000 and $1.5 million if you sell it. If you're a product business or you're doing a productized service, it's one of the topics we talked about with the cohort, is how do you use tools and technologies to automate the front end process of marketing? We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks on November 5th. And then what tools and technologies do you use in the back end to help you automate the delivery process and keep your margins higher? The, the concept there is that you don't have to, for every new customer, you don't have to add new staff, right? Or for every six customers, you don't have to add new staff. So, um, so generally a services company, 0.75 to 1.5 X trailing 12 months revenue, but a product company, if you're in the product business, that business might sell between greater than four times trailing 12 month revenue. So if a million dollar product company, it could be worth $4 million plus in software and recurring revenue subscription businesses get you somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 times uh, trailing 12 month revenue. So the type of business really determines the type of value. So if you're all services today, you may think about adding product uh, or productizing your service and making it something that customers are, can buy a SKU or a, a, a bundled package. And then they don't care how many hours or people are behind actually delivering it. It's just, they're buying the outcome and then you can automate some of the ways you can deliver the service. So the valuation drivers there are revenue, um, growth rate. So if your company's growing at a good rate versus if it's flat. Sector and addressable market. How big is the, your potential customer base? Um, and how big is the sector? And profitability. So if profitability um, is going up and on the increase, then there's folks who will look at it versus just straight growth. And then customer retention, right? So how many customers do you, do you retain on an annual basis? And is your customer base growing? Um, are you having significant churn? So, and then the last component is having more than one buyer at the table. So think of this as just a competitive process, just like selling that classic car. If I have more than one buyer, it's easier to bluff around like, I really need to get a better price than that. But if it's the only buyer you have, sometimes you'll get, you'll get pinned into the corner and you just wanna be careful about that. You wanna create optionality for your company. So it may be another buyer in a different geography or somebody else in the, in the industry segment. So, and we've typically seen that increase the value of the company by 50%. So, which is not unusual. So those are your valuation drivers and factors. So growth, profitability, company revenue as a whole, if the company's particularly small or, or particularly large, you just get to a different buyer profile. So as a buyer, um, give you an example here, you may look at it and say, hey, there's a company that's in Shreveport, we'd love to have, they've got a good reputation, we've always liked working with them, um, but I know the owner's getting ready to retire. So you may be able to do a deal with them where you give them 50% cash and 50% over time, for example, over five years. And that 50% could be based on uh, a salary payment. And again, I'll go through an example with that with a, uh, a company that, that I was on the board of. So it could be 25, 75, by the way. So if you have the cash to put up a little bit of cash, it's the, the process of this is how we do the mechanics. It doesn't have to be all cash is my, is my big point. You can do what's called an asset purchase, which is you buy their inventory, um, you buy their customer base, but if they have a lease in a building, you can leave liabilities behind. So there's two mechanics for that in that's an asset purchase or a stock purchase or the two mechanics. An asset purchase is just the simplest and cheapest one to do. Uh, you're going to then provide the seller with a job, which is they're going to have a set term. So they're going to stay for five years. You're going to pay them this much money. But as you know, as a business owner, that seller then doesn't have to think about payroll on a monthly basis or what their profitability is or 
you're, you're giving them a job and you're having to manage the operations or particular tasks. Um, you're going to provide the operating cash and the expertise and partially mo motivation, right? If you want to grow um, a company and double your business in the next year, one way to double a business might be to buy an additional 50% of that 100% growth revenue. You're going to pay the seller over times with the proceeds from that growth. So keep in mind, the idea here is that you have to have a plan and the confidence to grow the business um, versus just paying them over time and not grow the business. So it's about, again, back to you and your desire to grow the company. Um, but as a buyer, that's the way to think about it. So you don't necessarily have to have much cash to, cash to do that. And like I said, if the seller is somebody who's like, I just want to retire and capture some value from this and my customers take care of my customers and my employees, the answer is that may be a great company to buy. Um, offer components, what's an offer look like? So you have Think of it as the deal components and the key employee components. The deal components are asset or share purchase, which I mentioned. The dollars that go to the shareholders or to the owner up front could be 25%, could be 50%. How much of that money is going to go into escrow? Um, so for example, some of it may go into escrow for the first year. Let's say it's a 50% transaction um, and 25% is going to go to the owner now and then 25% is going to go into an escrow. You still have to put up the money for it, but it goes into an escrow account where the money's held. And as long as the seller hits all of the milestones that they've said that they would meet for you in the first 12 months, at the end of that 12 months, they get the additional 25%. And then they still get paid as if they're an employee. So, and then earnouts will be something that says, okay, in that five year window that Dave's going to work for you, um, my earnout is going to be, here's my salary, but if I help drive more profitability, I may get 10% of that profitability from the business. So my incentive is still there to be a participant, but I'm not driven to run the business the way I was before. And I have somebody I'm working for with you. So think of that as the earnout process is, is there upside for me as the seller? And the answer is, yeah, Dave, if you stay and help grow the business and the combined business, I want to create upside for you. That compensation is really key employee package incentive. So think of it as pre-deal structure and post-deal structure because you have employees that you're likely to get as well. And when those employees come over, they're gonna look at you and say, hey, what do I get for staying? And more than just a job, right, for key employees. Um, for many companies, especially as owners, the answer is we're always underpaid, right? Until the company hits a particular milestone and then it's a challenge. But the, the concept there is we want to uh, create a package for employees after the deal that has some sort of time-based milestone and performance-based milestones that you're, you're not just raising your fixed overhead, you have some variable overhead that says we'll pay out over time. So those are the typical offer components. All right, I'm going to give you a little geeky with you on the due diligence checklist because this is where things get, where deals go bad. <laughs> so uh, it's by, based on not doing the research on the company itself. So these are broad categories. You'll see that that headline is a, is, a, uh, is a link. It'll take you to my blog that has a list of the due diligence checklist and it's a four page due diligence checklist. So don't, this is the, this is the primer on it. It's not designed to give you the full, the full meal deal. So one of the things you're gonna need if you're buyer or seller is three years of financials. They don't have to be audited financials by any means, but they do need to be provided by your accounting firm. And that'll include your balance sheet and your income statements. So what I'm looking for there is the trend, right? Is the, is the business, you know, where's the business going? Is it trending up? Is it trending flat? Um, and then what's the story narrative you're going to tell with that, right? Hey, we lost our big customer. Hey, we, we've gained some new customers. Um, if the business is trending up, I guess it'd be this way. Um, for me, it's that way. Um, if the business is trending up, the story you get to tell is future 12 revenue versus trailing 12 revenue. If the business is flat, the answer is it's a, it's a tougher story to sell, right? But the narrative there is, boy, if we had your team with our team, we could grow the business faster. That's more up and up and to the right. Um, so, or if we had your guys' product lines, we could sell those products to our customers. So part of selling a company or buying a company for that matter is figuring out what the story is of what the combined entities look like, right? Because if I can't figure out that story, it's hard to sell it to my, my partners as the buyer, right? So, and that may be my wife, 
right? Because every once in a while I'll write a check to a startup and she's like, what does this company do? And I will guarantee you, if I can't explain what the company does, the check does not get written, right? And every buyer is the same way. Every buyer has somebody else who's, they're going to answer the question to you. Like, why'd you buy it? Or why are you going to buy that company? Oh, I really like the founders. No, I need to, I need a story to tell there. And part of it is you have to frame the story for them. So if you, if you bought us, you get access to the New Orleans market, you get access to the customer base, you get access to uh, these materials and these products, right? So that's the value. So my very first startup, um, we grew the company really super fast. And then we sold to one of our bigger competitors and they were getting ready to go public. And we had one distribution agreement that they didn't have. So they needed to acquire us before they went public because they needed that distribution agreement. They also wanted our revenue as well, but the story we knew from a priority standpoint was they have a deadline to buy because they're going public and they need this deal. So that gave us increased ways to add value, not just tell the story about revenue. And yours is the same, right? You, you just have to tell that story. If you're a buyer, you have to tell the story too, right? I'm gonna give you 25% now and 25% at the end of 12 months. And then I'm gonna pay you the other 50% in salary over time, over five years the seller is going to look at it and say, why is that a good deal for me? And their answer might be, oh, compared to closing the business down after 25 years, the answer is it's a great deal for you, right? But you have to tell that story and the story is there in the numbers, in the financials, but you still have to figure out how to tell that story as part of it. You're also going to do a forecast or what's called a pro forma um, forecast and a financial model, which is what's the business look like afterwards? So if I took your financials from three years and my financials for three years, now I need to tell a forward-looking story or a forecast of that combined revenue and combined entity. What would it look like? Because you're going to use that to either get money from the bank or get money from investors or just for you to have confidence that says, this is a good purchase price. Like I can see how I can make money on this one. So future growth is that story you're telling. Then I'm going to look at the corporate documents right, which is the articles, the bylaws, and the minutes. There may not be any minutes, and that's okay, right? But the articles of incorporation um, have things like, who are the equity owners? Who owns what percentage of the company? The bylaws have things like notification rights. So if there's two partners that originally started, when do you have to provide shareholder meeting notifications and what kind of approvals? So most of us as founders never look at the bylaws when we file them, because our attorney files them when we incorporate. And then when we get to the end and we're looking to do a deal, the bylaws are what dictates how you do what you do. And they're completely dry and boring until you need them. And then when you need them, people are like, hey, I was talking with a um, customer yesterday and he was talking about he's got um, convertible debt that they haven't exercised and they never raised around the funding and what do we do with it? And I'm like, send me the documents. And I'm not an attorney, right? But I paid for a lot of attorneys. So send me the documents and I'll give them a look for you and we'll see what, what we think we can do from an action standpoint, what's next steps. But like I said, none of those documents are stuff you pay much attention to at the time because the attorneys did them. And then when it gets to an exit, you're like, oh, I really need to know what to do with those. Uh, so securities and indebtedness could be stock documents or any debt um, that you have on the company. Uh, employee agreements, so employee personnel agreements and what's called a PIA, which is a personal information um, agreements and, and, and assignment agreements. So an assignment agreement is if I come to work for you and I write software, you own it versus I, me owning it, or we don't jointly own it. So it's, you know, things like non-compete agreements and things like that. So you're going to look at all of those agreements as well. Contracts then become the next thing you look at, customer contracts in particular, um, things like leases. I want to look at all of those things and see if there's any clauses in those things that have created a challenge for me as a buyer. Um, or for you as a seller, right? Any disputes or litigation pending or current, uh, currently happening, happened in the past or pending because you have to disclose those things if they're pending litigation. Uh, regulatory, if any. I've only been involved with a, a couple of companies that had any regulatory environment, but um, one was a seafood company that I'll talk about in a case study and something changed over time and they're on the waterfront in, in the Northwest and you know, water management and wastewater management ends up being a regulatory issue we have to disclose even though there, at the time there was nothing to worry about, but those laws change. So it's a risk factor. And the last one is taxes. 
So there's some things um, that are protectable and some things that aren't protectable, but things like employee, um, uh, social security and employment, unemployment insurance and, and taxes are all the taxes paid and all the taxes current. So the big picture on this one is make sure that if you're gonna go in the buyer mode, um, for some businesses, these docs are super rough. Like no one's paid any attention to them for years and years. And then you're like, oh, I'd like five years of financials and people are like, our oh, numbers aren't really good. Um, you can clean them up relatively quickly, but just know that corporate hygiene is one of the things as boring as it is. My accountant friends are like, we love it when you talk about corporate hygiene. I'm like, no one else does, but the accountants do. Um, deal blockers or deal breakers. Um, inflated expect, exit expectations. If you're buying somebody, they're going to think their company's worth more than it is. It's, it's exactly the example of that classic car, right? You're like, I want this for it. And the buyer's like, mm, no. Like, I love it, but I don't love it that much, right? So inflated expectations is always a challenge. Um, and one of the conversations that I have early with potential buyers or potential sellers is if it's the seller, um, and we do a lot of sell side deals where we help companies get sold, I'll have a conversation that says, hey, listen, what's your realistic floor? Like, if, if we can get this number and above, we definitely think about selling. But if we can't get this number, we'd rather just keep running the business. And that's one of those quiet moment conversations you have to have with yourself about like, what's that number? Because um, if you go out with too high of an expectation, you're going to be disappointed. And the same thing is true with the, if you're the buyer and you're talking to a potential seller, you know, the early conversation is, sorry, the, the, the pup is trying to get access to the, to the room. Um, if, you're, if you're the seller, in, or sorry, if you're the buyer, then the, the question then becomes, Hey, what are we, what's your realistic expectation of what you would sell for? Because we don't want to get into a long lengthy process if the fact is, is that the number's not there. So it's okay to have the conversation early with the seller and say, what would you, what's the number that you'd want to get? Right. And it's not just a straight negotiate. I'm pretty transparent as a negotiator. Um, so, uh, but I, I would encourage you to have that conversation early. Um, and set an expectation for either yourself as a seller or for yourself as a buyer. Hold on just a second. So we used to have a, a pup who was never concerned about, she was acted more like a cat, right? But, but this one is as a seven month old puppy is like, when I want your attention, I want your attention now. And you've seen more humanity now than you've seen in the last, or the last eight months have been good for that, right? So, um, and thanks, Val. Any questions now, feel free to ask. So uh, a couple other deal breakers or deal blockers. Um, so poor corporate hygiene, as I mentioned, uh, taxes or, or you know, any tax documents that haven't been done recently or a challenge, um, any bad or unknown news. So one of the things we, we always tell sellers is, uh, listen, time kills all deals. So if you wanna do a deal and you decide to do a deal, then let's figure out how to get the deal done and get it done as quickly as possible. But you don't want to be in the, um, you know, uh, in the bad news perspective. And then surprises, right? So, um, you know, your financials aren't done in GAP and using accounting methods that are standard. Um, you don't get to make up your own accounting stuff. Like, uh, remember Groupon? Groupon created their own terms for GAP accounting. No, you don't get, right? You don't get to do that. Um, so cash accounting or loans to yourself or things like that. Those are things that are just um, deal blockers or deal breakers. So you just need to know that if they're there and you want to get that part of the story out early, right? So you can imagine if you're a buyer and you go to meet with a seller in a different city in Shreveport and you find out that there's a, uh, a loan to a family member that's on the books from the company that hasn't been paid for a while. And you're like, if you're the buyer, you're like, things like that are going to drive the price down. If you're the seller, you want to figure out how to disclose those things super early in the process. So just know that that's part of the process. All right, case study wise, let's talk about a couple of case studies. So one is um, uh, a family owned transition business. This is a, uh, it was a 95 year old seafood company when I joined their board and 10 years ago, so now 105 years old company, third generation, uh, super interesting case study. 
Uh, it was three sons were all applying to run the business. We're, they're the third generation. So grandfather started it, passed away. Dad uh, was in his late 60s and wanted to transition and spend more time uh, doing other stuff. Um, and so all three boys applied to be CEO, which makes Thanksgiving super awkward, right? Is if dad chooses who the CEO is. So the dad brought in an outside board to help choose the CEO and to help create a structure and a process. So they negotiated the price between the dad and the sons. We weren't involved as the, as the board. Um, they used a third party to help facilitate it. But like I mentioned early on, is if you're gonna sell your business to your family or your kids, they're gonna use your money to pay you back for the business. Versus if you sell the business to a third party, they're gonna use real cash to pay you back. So in this case, they set a 10 year window um, for a payback. And it was up to then the CEO, which ended up being the middle son to take all the drama away, um, to build a growth plan with the board um, to help build a growth plan to both pay back um, the dad and also to create opportunity for the company for the future growth of the company. So, um, so that was the process that they went through. They used uh, the board um, for the dad to not have to bring all the family relationships into it. And the other two sons stayed on the board of the company as the three owners. Anytime you go multi-generational, by the way, there's always something quirky about it because somebody who's not directly involved with the business always thinks that somebody else is holding out some numbers, right? So it's just, it, it creates some quirkiness. So you have to over-communicate. So by bringing on an outside board, um, that's one of the ways we, he went about doing it. Um, so a question here, uh, what are some of the best practices for startup companies to follow in order to be Great businesses to sell within five years. Totally great question. So I think if you look at the market that you're in now, one of the things you want to start looking for is, well, I'll talk about this in the business development process after the case studies. So I'll actually park that question for now. Uh, lead time to prep to enter into a selling situation, probably four to six months, Wayne, as far as prep goes. Like I've, I've done it in, we've done deals in four months and they were pretty, they were pretty buttoned up. Like the the, the financials were done, the taxes were clear. Like if, if those things are done, you could get a transaction done in four months, usually six months. So we did one over the summer that we closed in July, all on Zoom, by the way, never met the sellers until we were in final finals and the CEO flew to Atlanta to meet the seller. So definitely uncharted waters. <laughs> but So it's doable, right? But you need to think about it as a, if the corporate hygiene is done and if those things are clean, totally okay. Um, uh, all right, so, so that's case study one. So the business when we joined as board members was about a $40 million company and grew to about a $90 million company over 10 years. So super exciting, but it was never gonna exit because as a 95 year old family business, right? They weren't gonna go sell to somebody else. So we weren't thinking about selling it once the transition happened. We were thinking about transitioning it from second generation to third generation. And how did we do that and preserve the family relationships and dynamics, thus bringing a board, right? And then the growth plan and supporting the new CEO and that growth plan. So in this case, the dad got paid out on an annual term that looked like salary so he could stay on benefits, right? But basically it had a, a time frame for that 10 year payback with his expectations of participation in the company going down over time. And I'll tell you at the end of the first year, the new CEO, the middle son was like, yeah, he needs to be out of the office more than in, like he's been in the office too much, right? Which is hard because he'd been in the business since his, his father started it, right? He'd grown up in the business. He's already been around the business. It's part of his identity. Um, and the reason I bring it up is when I sold my first company, um, I'm like, I, it's part of my identity. <laughs> like, what do you do when you're done? So that's case study number one. Uh, case study number two is a strategic sale. Um, the, the company we just sold, um, one of the things that we did with them, this is actually an earlier version than when we sold over the summer. So we had ongoing business development discussions with strategic partners. So we looked at it kind of a, to your five-year question is who is likely to be an upmarket buyer and how do we partner with them earlier? So using business development as a path to build a relationship. So that's really part of the process. Um, we saw one strategic basically had a letter of uh, indication of interest or so indication of interest or letter of intent, basically the same thing with different levels of 
commitment. And IOI is basically, um, hey, show us your due diligence checklist in the, what's called a data room. So you have like a, a Google Drive um, that we take all of your corporate docs and we move them to a thing called OneHub or something like OneHub. The difference between a Google Drive and a OneHub or a data room is really just all the documents are watermarked. And you know who went in and looked at all of the documents. So it'll show you a history of who's looked at all the documents, when they looked at it, how long they looked at it. And if somebody prints out something or does a screen capture, you'd see Dave Parker's name across your screen capture right now so that it would show that who, who if that document got out and got public. So they signed a non-disclosure agreement. They signed a letter of intent. We gave them access to the data room. They had uh, 30 to 45 days to get a deal done. And at, uh, in that case, we actually started a competitive process at the same time and brought multiple deals to the party, our multiple um, bidders. And it ended up selling to a strategic buyer, not the person who with the initial indication of interest. And it sold for about 50% higher. Um, so, uh, just know that again, competition is good. It gives you confidence as a seller to make sure you're like, you're willing to negotiate versus if you have one deal in hand, you're like, ah, I'll probably just take that deal versus trying to drive the price up. Um, I mentioned business development as a driver for M&A, but this is really the way to think about it is you, you know, should you be talking to your competitors? Sure. Don't sell, don't share secret sauce or, you know, the corporate secrets. But it's the fact is, is they're going to learn from looking at your website or they're going to learn from uh, watching what you do. You may as well have conversations with them, right? Is it a trade show, an industry event? Like build those relationships and upmarket relationships because if they're the bigger company, at some point they may look at it and say, hey, we've, you know, we've always been, we've worked around each other for 10 years or five years. Um, I always thought you ran a great business. Like let's figure out how we put the two businesses together. So those are your strategics. Uh, private equity fear on the larger side. There are companies who, if you're doing three million in revenue and and you know half million or more in in, in profitability and EBITDA, uh, so it's earnings before tax and depreciation expense. Um, private equity buyers are making a straight financial decision to buy you, and they could buy all the business or part of the business. But again, think of those as like they're just doing the math. Like if we give you cash now and you continue to run the business, we'll both make more money on the back end of it but you use, lose a lot of the control that you're used to having as an autonomous founder or a solo founder. So that's a process you can use to help build relationships over time. So with that, I'm gonna kick it open for Q and A. We're right at kind of the, the top of the hour and we've got about 15 minutes for Q and A for you. And, and uh, feel free to ask any specific questions you have about your particular deal. Or if you wanna take them offline, I'm happy to do that too. Dave, so are there websites or there places where people would go to sort of say find companies that are looking for companies like theirs or, yeah. or is it that you just use a broker? Well, I mean, so there's, it's a great question. Um, so there's a, a website called Biz by Sell, B-I-Z-B-U-I-S-E-L-L. -L, and that has a list of businesses that are for sale. So you don't always have to use a broker. You can use um, an, an attorney to help you with the deal terms, as long as it's an attorney that's done it before. You can use a broker. Um, so in brokers come in kind of two, eh, about three varieties. There's kind of straight business brokers that are trolling through biz buy sell and looking for people. And they, they, they feel more like a real estate broker, right? They tend to be geography based. Um, they tend to sell businesses that are relatively small and they take a straight commission for it very much like a real estate broker would. Um, so, uh, so those biz brokers are, um, they're, they're in the market. You should expect to, to, to talk with them, especially if you are gonna list your business. Then you have advisors, a little bit like what Mark and I do for, for Next Path, which are larger stage companies. They have a minimum fee involved and the minimum fee may be too high. Um, and then you have broker dealers and the big investment banks or kind of the next tier. Um, those folks aren't gonna do a, a deal for less than a million dollar fee. So the answer is probably out, right? But what you wanna make sure is that you have somebody who understands the business can help you tell the story if you can't do it yourself. And they're working on a basically a commission basis to help you get the deal sold. Now, the dilemma I've always had with real estate brokers is they just wanna make the transaction regardless of the cost at times, not all of them, but in my personal experience, some of them. So 
you want to make sure your incentive is tied to their incentive. So for example, stair-stepping the commission based on performance. So if you sell it for this price, you get this deal and it's a lower percentage of commission. But if you stair-step the price up, our goals are aligned, right? So um, we typically see incentives where we help companies stair-step their valuation. And if we drive a higher price point, we get a higher percentage of commission on those incremental dollars. So great question, Lynette. Um, other questions? Yeah. There are conglomerates formed mainly by buying and merging businesses. Yeah, so that's typically the financial buyer and the private equity firms. So what they're doing is they have an investment thesis around a particular vertical, an industry vertical, and they like the profitability of those businesses. So for example, if you know um, the, uh, the pest control business, there's typically one big company and then they go and buy local pest control businesses and they look at the math of your financials and they're like, we like your financials, we'll give you X amount of cash. And then as you grow the business, we'll give you Y amount of profits. So it's very formula driven, right? Which for us as founders is really hard because we're like passion and customers and employees. And then somebody comes along and says, well, we'll give you X amount of math and then this amount of, and you're like, it's very formula driven. Uh, so it feels kind of heartless to sell, but sometimes it's still a great price. So like the big, um, the big international, like Sterotech would be an example of a company who buys a lot of regional pest control companies and rolls them up into one brand. And then their, um, that conglomerate then saves money in the back office and uses its national brand. So it's not a franchise per se, but it's really a roll up or a conglomerate. Other questions? So Dave, some of the things that I've seen, like mainly in construction, mm -hmm. where you may have an electrical commercial, you know, electrical company, um, they're doing fairly well. And then maybe they decide because they're projects that they've been working in where mechanical, you know, might be the next big thing, right? Does it right. make sense for like an electrical company to buy another company that is solely unrelated, but it's still under the construction umbrella, right? Well, and so how different- Think of that as a vertical integration uh -huh. is typically the way. So I'm good at this particular trade. I'm good at this, um, this particular area. A lot of our projects have additional work that needs to be done and we're not capturing that revenue. So one way to do that is to buy an existing company that has existing revenue and expertise and then add that to your portfolio. So the way to look at that if you're the, the buyer is what are the adjacent markets or adjacent verticals? So today we're in this business, we do commercial construction in X. Do we see a lot of opportunities in HVAC where we think there's opportunity for profit? Or do we see a lot of, our, you know, in electrical where we think there's opportunity for profit? Um, so I, I look at it and go, what are the market adjacencies that are next to my business today? Which one do I think is most profitable where I have some core competencies or I know somebody, a person in my team came from that industry. And then do we look at somebody as a, to buy them and roll them into the bigger company? So the way to look at that as the buyer then is you're still gonna go through the same mechanics, but the decision you make before getting into the buying mechanics are which vertical, which uh, adjacency, which market, and then have a hypothesis of like, I think electrical is better for us than HVAC because we don't need technicians in HVACs or higher or, or union labor in, in uh, electrical is higher. So maybe we go with one or the other, but I make that sort of decision and like, what's my buying decision process? Mm -hmm. And I mean, do you think there's any drawbacks to that though? I mean, um, if, if you're taking on mechanical, there's, there's still a sizable amount of business that you can, you know, that you can procure, but um, is there any drawbacks that might take away from what you were doing already, right? Maybe you're taking sure. on too much. Maybe you're- Focus <laughs> you is know, always what, a problem. What are the things that people should think about? You know, this sounds like a great idea that I could now capture so much more of the market, but what are the pitfalls? What are the things that they're not thinking about? What should they yeah. be looking at? Well, as a seller, the number one thing is don't miss your numbers while you're doing this process, mm -hmm. right? Because what happens is, um, you know, I'm super focused on the transaction and all the details. And I've got lots of tasky sort of stuff. And then you're 15 days into your into the month and you realize you're going to miss your revenue number, your revenue target for the month. Because that, that will create price goes down, right? Um, so don't, don't take your eye off the ball. <laughs> right. Like keep your, keep your eye on like revenue and growth yeah. and profitability. Like don't, don't mess up that one. Cause that'll hurt your price. You still may get a deal done, mm -hmm. um, but it may hurt your price. 
um, you don't wait too long to sell, right? So like we, a friend of mine uh, tried to sell his company, super, super great guy. They had a escrow agreement to sell the company. The company, the buyer did not put the escrow money into the escrow and they let it go, right? So in essence, what they had was, oh yeah, we're gonna put, a, let's call it a million dollars into the escrow. And if we break up this deal for any reason other than cause, then the, the buyer loses that million dollars. So think of like an escrow when you buy a house, right? Maybe five or $10,000 by comparison. Um, so the, the challenge there is they didn't force the company to put the money in escrow. The buyer saw that they were less than 30 days away from running out of cash and not making payroll. So they, they slow rolled the deal, right? And delayed closing, which left them with this weird decision of like, oh my God, if we don't get the money for payroll from the buyer, uh, we have to lay everybody off, in which case the value of the company goes down. So the CEO and, and owner of the business basically had to look at it and say, do I let them take advantage of me or do I do close the whole company down? And he ended up sending out an email to a bunch of other CEOs in town that he knew and said, hey, we're basically selling everything and you can interview my entire team because I don't want my team going to this bad buyer who was a bad actor. And he set up interviews for his entire team to get interviewed and like 80% of his team got hired and they ended up not doing the deal, which is super hard. But it, part of it is the, the lesson learned is if there was an escrow, you have to enforce that that escrow was going to happen. Because in, if you're too close to running out of money, that's a problem, right? And I think that's always the problem, especially I saw the note here too about commonly laid mistakes um, about you know bankruptcy. It's like, if you're living too close to the edge, right? That's, that's a problem, right? And by the way, I say that from, not as a criticism, I say it from personal experience, right? So I had to, of the five companies I started, I had to close two of them. But being a perpetual optimist as a founder, you're like, no, it's going to get better, right? Okay. And during yeah. the recession, the answer is, oh, hell no, it did not get better, right? <laughs> it was just, it was tough. So I say that as not as a, uh, I say it from being an insider and going, oh yeah, no, I've seen that dark phase to go through. It's not fun for sure. Um, so commonly made mistakes that lead businesses to bankruptcy, overly optimistic is number one. Uh, you know, it's, it's just like, oh, it's going to get better. Things are going to be good. Mm. Like when we talked about pivoting a few weeks ago, if you didn't see that one, please go grab a look to that. I think I would, I would say I'm perpetually optimistic as a founder. I Most founders are though. <laughs> yeah, well, we're on, the, we're on the brink of delusional. Yeah, I don't right? think I've ever met a optimism. pessimistic founder. Yeah, it's past optimism. So, um, so I think when, you, when I look back at the one we closed in 2008, 2009 during the Great Recession, uh, so the company I was running at the time was an international company that helped U.S. companies launch their presence in China and found bilingual talent in China to help them do that. So the business was growing, compound annual growth rate was great, monthly growth rate was great, right up until September of 08. And before firing started, the layoff start, started, the hiring stopped. So within a week or two weeks, we went from customers, revenue, hires, and two weeks later, it's like nothing. And so to ask, to answer your question, Rikia, the answer was, I'm like, I can, we'll just sell something else, right? We'll just sell services, right? We'll, we'll become a professional services company because we have developers and we have blah. But at the time, all of the software development work was focused on social media and getting stuff connected to social and Facebook and Twitter and blah, blah, blah. But in the great Chinese firewall, you couldn't test any software against that because you were blocked. So I went to a business that I knew, started to, to try to sell something different and was too optimistic about that. And I kept the company open six months longer than I should have. And personally, it was super expensive because I didn't want to fire my team. So it, I took money out of my savings and my debt to fund the team that in retrospect, I should have looked at and gone like, oh my God, this is not going to get better anytime soon. And social is not going to work in China. So we shouldn't be in that business. And that was a super hard decision because you love your team and you've got investment and you know, your sunk cost in any business is so freakishly high that you're like, well, I can't, I can't walk away from it at this point. Now I'm a little more clinical, right? So the, the difference between an ER doc um, working on a patient, you're like, I hope they will survive. And like that patient's my child. There's a really big difference between those two things. 
So know that that's part of the process and just being objective and knowing when to cut your losses. So, so Dave, uh, there's a question too. Uh, any uh, books that you'd recommend anybody to read more on the subject? Boy, on M&A, there's not a lot yet. There's a M&A from A to Z. It's funny because I have it on my sh on my shelf. I bought it when I sold my first company um, because I was like, ah, I'm in uncharted territories. I've never actually done this before. Um, and there's a lot of great blog posts on it, mostly from people who are you know, brokers or broker dealers. Um, and broker dealers tend to be finance people who came from finance or from investment banking. Um, I tend to take it from a founder perspective. That's why I care about what the founder wants to do first. And we try to work with companies that are founder controlled companies versus venture controlled companies or investor controlled companies. Because when you, when you start getting into that path, they have very different objectives, right? So the investor is like, no, we want you to go as long as you can. And the founder is like, I'm, I've been pushing this ball uphill for nine years. I'm like tired, right? And I'm kind of a fan of um, when the founder says it's time to sell, it's time to sell. So you got to know what you got to know what you're what you're, you're in it for, right? As a founder, after all, you've done all the work. So, so merger. Any other questions? All right. Well, you need to come back in March, or I'm sorry, March, November fifth for the marketing session because that one's actually my favorite session. We're going to focus on what tools and tech can you build in a, in a few hours or a few days that will help you drive revenue at the front end of the business and will help you improve your margins at the back end of the business. Um, so I'm, I will confess to being a tool junkie, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to find things that make my life easier. And if you were on the session we did uh, mm -hmm. last week, I was talking about Fiverr as a place to do super tasky stuff. Um, I have a confession to make. My 2019 tax reconciliations for all my bank accounts wasn't done. So I paid my taxes and you know, I'm like, I may have to amend them, but I'm like, I, I haven't reconciled this because I lost my, my bookkeeper. So I posted the job. Uh, I thought there was a certain number of transactions. It ended up being about 50% more transactions, but I found somebody who did all of that reconciliation on my QuickBooks online account for less than $300. Wow. And it took them four days. Like I couldn't, I spent more than four days, I spent more than $300 thinking about the problem and it, they had it done in four days. So yeah, so we'll spend some time talking about what are the tools and, and hacks that you can use that make up for the fact that you're not a great marketer yet and all of that's okay. Uh, there's the last question there, uh, tips on networking and COVID conditions. <laughs> yeah, that one's hard. I don't know a good answer for you. I've been, we've been doing a bunch of stuff with the industry stuff. So I would say leverage the uh, Invest NOLA's activities and looking for, you know, what are the right partners and what are the right industries. So I'm part of the Washington Technology Industry Association trade group, which is basically an industry trade show or trade organization. And so I've gotten plugged in there and volunteered and I'm on the board there. So it's my way to, to get plugged in and be seen as a thought leader in a particular category. So if there's a nonprofit organization like that where you can plug in as a, um, a volunteer or a lead, I would encourage you to think about it that way because it's a trade association that makes sense for my industry segment. So that's one practical way to do it for me. And yes, I love fiber as well. It's a, yeah, there's stuff where I'm like, if I have to think about how to do this, can I post that job and let somebody else do it? Um, the hack, the, I'll let you go with this one. I was going through, uh, we're finishing the book, edit stuff, and it's going back and forth with my final editor. And I'm like, you know, I should optimize my table of contents around search terms. So the headings for the chapters, I'd, like if I could change it slightly and tweak it, maybe it has access to like twice the amount of search terms. So I took all the table of contents headings, posted it as a job and said, should I optimize these to improve the search results? And I got two people that did that job in about a day. And I'm like, ooh, I should tweak that headline this way and that head. It's stuff that I'm like, huh, I wonder if I could do that. And the answer is, oh my gosh, I pay two people $50 each to do the same job to see if they came up with similar results was a great $100 spent. So things to think about. Wow. Lynette, thanks for the time today. I'll hand it back off to you. Great, great. Well, thank you, thank you. So you all just got I would say almost a personalized <laughs> session today with Dave by the group being so small. Um, people usually don't think they need to think about exit and it's something that you should think about when you start your business. 
Um, so hopefully, I know this information for me was very valuable and I hope you guys got you know, as much out of it uh, as I did. We appreciate you attending. Um, Dave has already told you all the reasons why you should be back here in two weeks on November 5th um, to talk about marketing. And it is just so much more than putting an ad together or, or doing a posting on so social media. So please come back for that. And as he said, that's his favorite topic. So um, please come back and invite some of your other entrepreneurial friends to come back. We don't do this often for free. Um, so um, we hope that you'll come back. But we also invite you all to visit our small business page at nolaba.org. Uh, we have some very valuable tools that were designed explicitly for small business use. We have a comprehensive data tool called the NOLA BIT or the Business Insight Tool. It will help you to look up a lot of the information you heard from Dave today about things that you need to do. Um, competitive analysis, it's a lot of publicly sourced data, but information that as a small business that you can use, it's all put there in one place so you don't have to link out to all of the different federal websites, it's all in one place. Um, on our website, free for you to use 24 seven. We also have a tool called the Crescent City Biz Connector. It's actually a navigation tool to help entrepreneurs find local assistance. So there's a number of organizations, probably somewhere between 60 and 70 organizations on there. You tell the system what you're looking for, it will give you a list of organizations that are available to help you locally. And then finally, we have an opportunities portal where members of um, the public and private sector procurement officers um, will actually post available opportunities for small businesses. So you should go there often because opportunities are posted every day. Um, so those are um, you know, opportunities for your small businesses. And then I'd like to thank our staff here at NOLA BA, Valerie Huntley, for putting all of this together and for making us look great all the time. Um, and then finally, to my friend Dave Parker, who is amazing and awesome um, and just knows everything entrepreneurial. Um, so Dave, thank you again. And we hope that you all got some valuable information. We hope to see you all back here on November 5th. And I think Valerie put the link to um, sign up for um, the next session in the chat. So you all can download that. You could take care of that today. And we will see you all back here on November 5th at the same time, 11 a.m. Excuse me, Lynette. Sure. Yes. Lynette, someone yeah. asked about the, when is the next cohort? Okay, actually we will be doing a cohort um, that starts in June next summer. Um, so look for the um, information and the links. You can come back to our site and look under Invest NOLA. Um, under our small business page, but we should start the recruiting uh, early in the spring of next year, and we'll be looking to do a new cohort uh, that will begin in June of next year. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, speak to you about the program. Okay. Enjoy your day, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody.